When you watch your enemy do that, mm -hmm. you're like, oh my God, the enemy's willing to take it there. There are two ways to do. Mm -hmm. You could become scared for your life and literally piss your pants. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, they are willing to do that. Or you can say to yourself, I will take it farther. Thanks for joining us as we peek behind the curtain of a grunt's life, where we dive deep into the psychology of our number one show with special guest Lauren Rich, a licensed clinical therapist who has been working with combat veterans for over a decade. Here, we'll discuss the ways in which the military mindset serves to win wars, but isn't as helpful for good mental health post-service. We'll also do a character analysis of Lieutenant Murphy, giving insight into his mindset and kind of psychotic behavior, kind of. So welcome to the path out of hell, boys and girls. Welcome back to our next episode of the mini series, Behind the Curtain of a Grunt's Life, starring Lauren Rich. And this is where we are going to understand how and why this thing was made. And we're gonna link up this movie to the psychology of combat veterans. We're gonna try and find things in here that, that we can use to help combat veterans have better mental health, lead a better, happier life. We're watching episode two. We just watched the opening scene where they're standing around the terrain model. This is called Hearts and Minds. They're standing around the terrain model and Murphy is doing kind of like a frago warno of the mission that they're about to do. And everyone's pretty unhappy about it. But Carl Reynolds is really confused as to why they're not doing exactly what the CEO uh, asked them to do. Hire wants us to conduct the BDA from here to here. It's the fucking minefield, sir. No shit. So listen up. Although Hire wants us to search from here to here, we will not be searching any farther north than the 87 Northing. Okay? 87 Northing is the tree line just south of the minefield. We'll be searching and reporting on all the bodies up till that point. Do we have any fucking questions about what we're doing here today, gents? Uh. Sir, what do we do when we get to the tree line? Shut the fuck up, Carl. So, Lauren has some thoughts here. <sighs> Poor Carl. Bless his heart. <sighs> uh, so, first of all, everybody has a Carl. Carls are everywhere throughout every unit. And um, I'm not saying that they're not obnoxious because they are. They're exhausting. It's visible on everybody's face. But Carl's real issue is that he does not feel wanted or accepted by the rest of the guys. Mm. And you can see that repeatedly in the show. And so he's constantly trying to prove himself, his knowledge, and, and it comes out in asking, well, ignorant questions when you blatantly just said, we're not going to go any farther than this. And he says, but we can't conduct a full BDA. You know, he's, he's pretty much a, a mini-me of the CO. Mm -hmm. He really is. Mm -hmm. Emotionally, they're almost identical. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, that's a great point. Yeah. So Carl is really just after being wanted and being accepted and your poor staff sergeant my gosh i just the man should be up for sainthood he runs interference between murphy and the co and then he has to deal with idiots like that that are just not grasping concepts not because they're not smart enough because they don't want to mm -hmm. so carl reynolds this character was a he used to be stationed at eighth and i okay where he is was this a direct replica of a person yeah oh okay oh yeah <laughs> okay he was stationed at eighth and i mm -hmm. where he was on the silent drill team you know what that is yeah vaguely okay so yeah. all the guys they swing the rifles mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. they look beautiful and they, they do they have they have looks but there's nothing beyond that yes mm -hmm. right so there's a lot of guys well i wouldn't say a lot but the marine corps pulls from every mos mm -hmm. in the marine corps and sends them to Ace and I to Ace and I to be a part of the drill team. Carl was one of them. So if you go, if you finish the School of Infantry, and then you go straight to Ace and I, that means you know nothing about the infantry. <laughs> yeah. And so they send this guy back into the infantry right before a combat deployment, and he doesn't know jack fucking shit, and he doesn't have anyone's respect. Mm -hmm. And it's a really, really, really shitty thing that the Marine Corps does because it is impossible for the Marines to respect him. 
right, which severely inhibits his ability to do his job, and coming back to the infantry as a sergeant means that he's a squad leader. Problem. And that's a problem, right? <laughs> yes. So, so there are um, there are some people in uh, first sergeants and gunnies, XOs, and even company commanders. They'll tell a platoon com commander, "Here's a sergeant. Make him one of your squad leaders." Mm -hmm. And the platoon commander, I mean, that's your platoon. No one should tell you what billet anyone should be in. It's platoon commander, platoon sergeant decision. I dealt with this when I was a new platoon commander. I had a private who was once a lance corporal or a corporal who got busted down for, oh, he broke the jaw of his team leader. That's what he did. He broke his jaw because his team leader was trying to haze him. He just knocked him the fuck out. And this dude was hard, and all he wanted was war and blood. And um, super aggressive, tactically proficient. Mm -hmm. It was exactly what I wanted in my platoon to reinforce a warrior's mindset. However, because he was a private, he was not a team leader. So now who's above him as a team leader? Is Incompetence. Some, some incompetent, <laughs> yeah. I don't remember if it was a Lance Corporal or PFC, mm -hmm. was ahead of him. And so he was just a, a fucking asshole to this guy because he's just like, you know, you know, you're gonna boss me around, I've been in the Marine Corps four years. Mm -hmm. Well, I made this guy a team leader. Because I'm like, he is completely worthless to the team not being in the team leader spot. And I'm looking at the team leader, and the team leader doesn't have anywhere near the technical and tactical proficiency that this private does who's been busted down. So I made him a, a team leader. And then I got told by, I don't remember if it was, it was my first sergeant or gunny, they see on the roster when they get the task organization of our platoon from the platoon sergeant. And they go to my platoon sergeant and they say, hey, why the fuck is he a team leader? He's a fucking private. Mm -hmm. And um, he explained, my, my squad, my sap, platoon sergeant at the time was a, a sergeant. So he, now he's explaining this to the first sergeant. And he was like, well, uh, lieutenant said that um, he needs to be the team leader because he's more technically entirely proficient. Well, that then, the, the first sergeant comes and tries to tell me, you can't make this guy a team leader. And I said, first sergeant, you can't tell me what I do with my platoon. That is not within your power. So he gets pissed off and he goes and talks to the, the executive officer and company commander becomes this big thing. And I was so fucking pissed off about that. Like, uh, w w what is going, and you know why, what it all came down to? It came down to the battalion commander thought it made his battalion look bad. Appearances. Appearances. Yeah. There's, there's one guest on Andy Stump's Cleared Hot podcast, and I cannot remember who it was, but he did it enlistment and he almost, I think he got out and then he came back in after 9-11. But in two years of a four-year enlistment, he was the Marine at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, an exceptional spot, and he got out. He ends up going back. I can't remember who it is, but he ends up deploying, if I remember right, and he said it taught me discipline and order. I was at the highest of my skill set because of discipline and order, but his personality allowed for that, and Carl's personality does not allow for that. Your guy's personality does not allow for that. Carl's issues are much, much deeper than not being accepted by these guys. We're talking not being accepted in junior high, not being wanted by parents or family members, mm. potentially abandonment, basically a lifetime of never being good enough, accepted or wanted. Mm. And that's what he desperately wants. He just wants acceptance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what's, what sucks is that in his position, what can you do? Mm -hmm. So you can you just do the best you can, but the bottom line is the Marine Corps should not have put him in that fucking position. Mm -hmm. No. I, I think that's no. part of the things that fuck people's minds up is that mm -hmm. the, the, the whole military experience, especially Marine Corps. And your staff sergeant, I, I'd be shocked if he wasn't already on some type of blood pressure medication. I mean, this uh -huh. guy has it coming at him from all sides. He never gets a break, mm -hmm. ever. He never gets a break. Yeah, because yeah. he has to babysit his platoon commander. Everybody. He has to babysit everybody. In addition yes. to the platoon, yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Platoon sergeants have such a rough go. Yeah. Okay. So let's jump to where they're in the BDA. In the BDA. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Got it, got it. So here they are. Oh. Yeah. I want to talk to this right here. So okay. Murphy walks up. Uh, he's, he walks up, comes on the scene. 43, you're on security. He's looking around. He's looking at that guy. That guy's breathing. Give me a 360 around the area. 
Search team, start with the center body right there. Jones, take the north side. Davis, take the He's south. He's like, that guy's still alive. Yo, let's get this guy over here. Damn, this guy's fucked up. Hey, Doc, stop wasting your time with this one. He's for sure going to die. Okay, so right here. Mm -hmm. I was infuriated by the thought when I was in combat that we had to treat um, the, the enemy was a part of our triage process. That's a problem for a lot of people. Massive, massive problem. Mm -hmm. And my thought was, no. Not doing it. Not doing it. If every one of ours is okay, mm -hmm. then we'll go attend to that guy. Mm -hmm. But I don't give a fuck if his legs are bleeding out and he's a, he's a higher level on the triage than our guy who maybe just has a gunshot wound in the leg. Mm -hmm. I don't care. He's going to die and we're going to focus on our guys first. That was my, my mentality. Mm -hmm. And that was what led to the scene. Here is fucking a platoon coming up on a group of guys that was attacking them. These are enemies of the United States who were trying to kill them. And he's just like, I don't want them to live. Now we're gonna have to process them. We're gonna have to go through all this work. We're gonna use our supplies to keep them alive. Who knows if there's an attack coming? Ah, fuck that. I'm gonna send Doc to go fix the guys that I know we're gonna die anyways. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna go make sure the guys who might live die. Mm -hmm. that, was, that was what this scene was all about here. Well. I mean, you conveyed exactly that. There's I did. No, okay. There is no question about that. So it's really complicated. It's complicated logistically because of what leadership expects of you. They expect you to take the enemy's life or medical condition into consideration. And that's a big problem with a lot of people. I mean, I have nurses who were majors in the army. I have uh, NCOICs of caches in southern Iraq that, that treated Iraqis. I mean, it is across the board a problem no matter who you are. Um, one of the biggest issues is valuing life and and you have said and you're okay with I'm gonna treat my men first they will come second yeah. I'm not saying I won't treat them but they'll come last Correct. okay I don't think there's anything wrong with that DOD may say otherwise mm -hmm. okay so we get into this and yes he intentionally sends the corpsman I feel bad for the corpsman too he intentionally sends the corpsman out to tend to men who he knows will die and he's gonna go take care of the rest. Mm -hmm. So as we go through the scene, we can see where Murphy is starting to compartmentalize. And, and the compartmentalizing is the separation of ideas, beliefs, emotions, sensations even. Um, and he is doing that in order to survive because he's, he's struggling with the cognitive dissonance. And, and all that is is having two or more beliefs or values that are conflicting. And so he knows that they cannot go any further in the BDA. He knows that for the safety of his own men, but he really doesn't want to kill anybody either. Mm -hmm. He would prefer that they just die on their own. Mm -hmm. I mean, that would be everybody's preference, right? So he's having to start to reconcile those two beliefs in the moment. This is nothing that gets reconciled here while he's dealing with it. This will be reconciled for years to come and potentially over his lifetime. Hmm. This takes a while. Yeah. Okay. Um, and when people deal with that, they end up feeling guilty about making those decisions. I, I am a murderer. I killed somebody. I'm a monster. A lot of them come in saying I'm a monster for things that I've done. And I'm not saying that it's not a violation of the UCMJ. You know, that's the most black and white issue of all of it, mm -hmm. if, we, if we want to take that stance. And as therapists, I will tell you, I have people in my office, not on a regular basis, but every now and then who they do disclose something that is a UCMJ violation to this degree. And I don't need to chart that. There is no need for me to chart that. Mm -hmm. I can log that in my memory. We can discuss and process it, but there is no need for it to be in writing. It doesn't benefit anyone for me to chart about that, especially if you're being seen at a government agency. The problem is not all therapists agree with that. And that's why, this is exactly why people do not want to come in to discuss things, because if I disclose what I've done, then I'm openly admitting that I committed a crime. Mm -hmm. That's the simple part. Yeah. The much deeper emotional part is that I had to make a choice that I didn't even and shouldn't have had to have made because somebody in a leadership position sent me out there when I shouldn't be here in the beginning. Mm. Should have never been there. Whatever intel was on them was probably old anyway. Mm -hmm. The intel game is constant. We are always behind in the intel game. 
Is that fair? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So if we're always behind and we've accomplished what we need to accomplish for the day, why are we even out there? Yeah. Yeah. There really is no purpose. So he's having to reconcile this process. But what he does and he continues to do is he's the only one making that decision. And he's telling the corpsman, nope, stay where you are. Yeah. Do not come over here. I got it. Take care of yourself. Mm -hmm. I'll be perfectly fine. He doesn't want him involved in any way. And in my opinion, that's really good leadership. When, when you're having to make an ethical decision like that, you want to involve as few people as possible. And he's done that. Another issue that comes up is when we see the next Marine who's looking back at him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how Respect. did you, how did you end up there? How did you end up having Marines watching what was going on? Was that something of your personal experience when you had a, a challenging situation or was that just good writing? So the initial thought mm -hmm. behind this here, it actually came from the movie The Pacific. Okay. And in the movie, um, one of the main characters, I don't remember if it was Sledge, it was a guy who ended up playing um, uh, Freddie Mercury, mm -hmm. uh, Remy Malek. Oh, I know who you're talking about. Yeah. Right, so that actor. Mm -hmm. So he was a sick fuck, and he was always, he's like carving up the dead bodies, and, um, and he'd cut up their, he'd, he'd cut out their teeth and shit, mm -hmm. like he was, he was nuts. And uh, I really appreciated the care with which he put into carving up the bodies. <laughs> and I was inspired by that when I watched the show. It was pre-combat mm -hmm. for me. And at one point, there was another guy, one of the guys in the show, that it, it was almost like the other guy hadn't been too um, warped by war yet. Mm -hmm. And so this, the character, Remy Malek's character, sees this guy about to go cut a tooth out or cut something else out. And he saw in him, like, he was like a nice kid, right? And he, he, he killed because he had to, mm -hmm. but he wasn't the kind of guy to start desecrating the bodies. And he watched him turn and it was, I think it was, uh, he was becoming more and more desensitized. I think he was angry because so many of his friends were dying. And he's finally gets to the point where he's about to desecrate a corpse. Mm -hmm. And Remy Malik sees it and he has a sense to say, I wouldn't do that if I were you. And then he's just like, why? And he's like, well, because this, this, and that, and this, this, and that. And he never actually said the real reason, mm -hmm. which the real reason is you don't want to go too far to the other side because you'll never come back. That's right. That's the real reason. Instead, he's given them all this other bullshit. And one of the things was they got bacteria in their mouth. If you cut your hand by mistake, you're gonna, you're, that infection could fucking kill you. Mm -hmm. And so he convinces the guy. And he essentially saved that guy's mental health mm -hmm. in doing that. And that is what inspired this, was I wanted Murphy to know that he is different. So we'll get to the ear cutting in a second. This Marine right there who's, who's looking at him mm -hmm. and seeing what's going on, and then he kind of turns his head away a little bit, this is going to be a real struggle for him because we now have to ask ourselves, which is worse, what we see the enemy do to each other mm -hmm. and do to us or what our own people do to the enemy? Yeah. You know, and so this is somebody who he really respects Murphy. Murphy's a good guy. He's a good leader. He protects his men. But now all of a sudden, he's dancing across that line. Yeah. Right. So that Marine is going to have to reconcile that process yes. as well. He's going to have some issues there. A, a lot of them what the will have issues. What the fuck did I just see? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, and who is this person that I thought I knew? Yeah. I didn't realize he was capable of that. Yeah. If he's capable of it, am I capable of that? Mm. Yeah, those kinds of questions. Yeah. So as for the ear cutting, I have not ever had anybody personally who reported this, but I have had colleagues who mm. have had these issues, and they were actually primarily with Vietnam, Vietnam era veterans. Era. That's where the ears come from. One of them in particular had 22 ears in a <sighs> shoebox in his attic, and um, it's one of those, when you have seen such gruesome violence, That's inspiring. you are so numb and detached. <laughs> <laughs> you are so numb and detached that it really doesn't matter anymore. And we're talking, this guy was seen within the last decade. And so he's had them in his attic for wow. 40 years at this point. Yeah. I mean, this is recent. And um, so the question was posed, why hang on to them? And he said, I hate them so much. And she said, what will happen if your wife or daughter find them when you die? 
And he said, at that point, I will not care. I will not be here to deal with it. If we hang on to that anger and that hatred and the rage, it keeps us from feeling the pain. That's the only purpose for this, is to avoid the pain. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and to top that off, once you have seen what they do to other people, the violence, I mean, cutting off genitalia, raping, murder, uh, you know, beheading online, Mm. all of those kinds of things, then it really doesn't seem to hold a whole lot of weight anymore. Look at what they do. I'm just taking an ear. Yeah. You know, those totally. kinds of things. Now, here's the real question. Mm -hmm. Why did so many guys cheer when he cut off the ear? Who cheers? In, in the showings. Actual oh, people. Oh, your showings? Yeah. Oh, well, I'm sure they want vengeance for Murphy. I have no doubt. Mm. I mean, everybody hates the enemy. The enemy in every storyline has to be punished. Hmm. They have to get what's coming to them. And the hero has to work through that process, overcome something. And part of that is him overcoming the anger and the rage. But with your crowd in particular, I have no doubt a lot of people could relate to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did yeah. they disclose why? Did they fill out a survey or anything? No. No, they just cheered? Yeah. Yeah. Well, everybody likes to beat the enemy, right? Yeah. At, at, in its simplest form. I have a thought. Because I always wanted to cut off ears. Mm -hmm. And if I had the chance, I probably would have. Okay. No, opportunity never presented itself. No. That's a lot of it is what it's about. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of it is about the opportunity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. For me, I'm trying to think about why I used to want to do that so bad. Was um, it just Hollywood inspired? Part of it, yeah. You know where I first saw ears? It was mm. in um, Universal Soldier. Oh, okay. <laughs> Dolph Lundgren. Okay. He picks up the ear and he's like, mm -hmm. what did he say? Oh, no, I forget the line. It was brilliant. Anyways, I, I, I remember seeing that moment. I'm like, oh, my God, that's so cool. And uh, But being there, I think for me, was I always wanted, I needed to prove to myself that I could not be detested or turned off by the sights of war. Because... I was, I, I, I knew that being good at war meant uh, I would be willing to be more savage than my enemy. And this is a very uh, old school mindset mm -hmm. that I think Vietnam, I think the guys who, who, were, who fought in the jungles of Vietnam, mm -hmm. I think part of why they are so fucking damaged psychologically is because they had the same mindset. Mm -hmm. What the Viet Cong were doing mm -hmm. to Marines and soldiers was insanity, mm -hmm. right? Like this, the, the booby traps alone, it's just a, wood sticks would come and impale you. Mm -hmm. They'd hang Marines and soldiers in trees and they'd gut them and let them bleed out over several days. I have men who report those things with children. I got attached to a kid, all of a sudden, kid was gone, I show up one day, kids hanging from a tree, yeah. insides are hanging out. Yeah, Yeah. right? And so mm -hmm. when you watch your enemy do that, mm -hmm. you're like, oh my God, the enemy's willing to take it there. There are two ways to do. Mm -hmm. You could become scared for your life and literally piss your pants. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, they are willing to do that. Or you can say to yourself, I will take it farther. And if you wanna be good at war, you gotta take it farther. But the political problem with that is that we are Americans and we are never supposed to do what the enemy does. It's an outright double standard, right? Which is the complete <laughs> fallacy. Yeah, which, which goes back to ridiculous ROEs that are written, and when I say written by Congress, I mean written for political reasons, you know? And yeah, it's those like we, things, wanna, we wanna hold on to this belief, but the reality yes. is, is yes. that mm -hmm. if you want to defeat a bunch of animals, you gotta be an animal. The belief is that we're better than them, that they are less than, which is why we're in their country, because they can't handle their own crap, mm -hmm. and that we should never stoop to their level, quote unquote. Mm -hmm. That's the belief. Yeah. So I will say that on, on, on the American side, the idea of stringing up kids and mm -hmm. whatnot, um, I don't know that I've, I've ever seen or heard of anything like that seeming cool. Mm -hmm. but stringing up the enemy. 
Sure. Stringing sure. them up. But that's it's what. Like, yeah. Uh, but again, that, you know, culturally, we are in countries that do not believe in what we believe in. Yeah. And so they're willing. I mean, they're not just willing to sacrifice children. They're using children as weapons of war. When yeah. you place bombs inside of kids, yeah. toddlers, you know, that that's says wild. something. That says something mm. about people. Yeah. And so. They're all, I mean, it's not just Murphy who's going to have to sort through this and figure this out. Everybody who is exposed to it is now going to have to sort through and figure these thoughts out. Yeah. Yeah. But ultimately, all this is is hiding the pain with anger and rage. Mm -hmm. And as far as the CO is concerned, Murphy feels like he has very little control in his life. He doesn't present that way. But internally, that's the struggle because he, he's not listened to, his thoughts are not acknowledged, his suggestions are always pushed to the side. Mm -hmm. And so then we end up in seemingly small scenarios where we can and will make decisions that are within our power. And this is a decision that's within Murphy's power, whether mm -hmm. or not these guys live or die. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, whether or not my guys move forward with the BDA. Mm -hmm. That is within his power. Yeah. And that's really what that scene is about. Yeah, totally. Um, I, uh, the reason that I asked about why did guys cheer mm -hmm. when they watched it is because that the, the cutting off of ears is part of a savage mindset mm -hmm. that I do not want to shame. I think that'd be that I think that's a horrible thing to shame mm -hmm. because first and foremost, the, the military exists not to go, not to, not just to defend the nation, mm -hmm. not just to go to war, but to win wars. It's a sport. And in this sport, losing means your nation submits to the will of another nation. Mm -hmm. So that means if you're going to be the best in the world, you have to identify all of the things that make you better. And psychology in any sport is equally as important as the physicality. Mm -hmm. So the psychology of having our Marines and soldiers who are on a battlefield where the enemy is taking our body parts and placing them on the road and using those as booby traps, knowing we're gonna go pick up our buddy's leg mm -hmm. and then bam, four more dudes get blown up, right? Mm -hmm. Knowing that that's the environment we're gonna be and they put piss and shit and needles and stuff in, in the IEDs. Um, our mindset has to be brutally, brutally savage. This is one of those where other people, and I think potentially some therapists, take things out of context. The most important thing about trauma work and working with veterans is that you must keep things in context. Yeah. It's not like we're seeing this guy in downtown Los Angeles. We're not seeing him in West Texas. We're not cutting ears off in Northern Ohio. We are doing all of this in, within the context of war in a foreign and violent land where they want to kill you. Mm -hmm. Bottom line, yep. if you start taking things out of context, you will lose. Yep. This is a mindset, this celebration of an ear necklace, mm -hmm. right? Because I'm telling you, the whole thought they of an ear cheered. necklace is yeah. the fucking coolest thing in the world yeah. to these guys, <laughs> uh, myself included. And, you know, because it's proof that I won in battle. Mm -hmm. It's my bling. Well, it's very primal. Oh my, it's and so yet, primal. And yet we're <laughs> taught that that's not okay. You know, you put me in war, but then I go to be a savage beast, which you t help train me to be, and then you tell me that I'm not okay. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So what I, what I want guys to understand is that if in the context of war, this mindset is good for winning wars. Mm -hmm. But you have to come out of this, and you have to understand how damaging a mindset like this is to good mental health. When people, when, when people come home and they talk about inner demons, this is the stuff that mm. they're talking about. Mm -hmm. The nightmares that come back, the feelings of guilt, of shame. Uh, again, I'm a monster. If anyone knew, they wouldn't love me. All of those kinds of beliefs. And I mean, I'm not saying that therapy is for everybody. Don't get me wrong. Some people can process without. But this really needs extra help. Mm -hmm. It does. Because you get so lost in the distorted labyrinth of your own mind that you will not be able to find your way out. And that is the line. Yes. When Murphy says, mm -hmm. you got to, you got to, sometimes you're going to have to be an animal, mm -hmm. but you can't go too far to the other side. That's right. Or you'll never come back. That's right. And the meathead does not get that. Mm -mm. He, what does he say? Two to the, two to the chest, one to the head? Yep. Yeah. Winning hearts and minds. Mm -hmm. Yes. And unfortunately, well, maybe fortunately, this, that particular guy is, I think, exactly what the American people think of when they think of a Marine. 
that typical jar head you know, I hate to be this this crass, I mean, crass, I'm on the crass show. Um, fornicate and fuck, that's what Marines are meant for, right? Oh, uh, uh, fuck and fight. Fuck and fight, fuck I'm and sorry. Kill. Yeah. Oh yes, yes, I'm sorry, fuck and kill, yes. Primitive. And so when we think Eat, about, fuck, kill. yes, when we think about the typical Marine, we're really thinking about the meathead, mm. right? The guy who says, two to the chest, one to the head, mm -hmm. who has zero emotional engagement with others, and he proves that episode after episode, and who really, um, will come home and potentially struggle more than others. On the other I side, you were say potentially strangle his wife, <laughs> and he might. He may. He probably won't ever get married. I mean, how do you open up to somebody who's completely numb and detached? Yeah, you know. But he also, on the flip side of that, he may do exceptionally well because if he can stay detached from all of that, he may never have problems. Hmm. I mean, it's such a a toss up, a hit and miss game. We never know who's going to struggle hmm. the most. There is no predicting who's going to struggle the most. Some people who've been through early trauma do better when they join infantry life because they have already seen some of the worst things on planet Earth. Yeah. Now, granted, does the trauma snowball? Absolutely, it doesn't make anything better. But we have other guys who their view of life is that most people are trustworthy. The world is a semi-safe place. Um, I, if I do good things, good things will happen to me. And then they go to war and that belief is completely rocked. Mm, shattered. And so sometimes the detached meatheads of the world do better than others. Yeah. No and I, I, I have known both. You've known both, yeah, known exactly. Guy. Savage beasts yes. in war, and then you come back home and crumble. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, cannot well, and, function. And the other part is they're really good at it. They're really good at going to war. And mm -hmm. and some of them come in and say, "What else am I supposed to do? I kill people for a living. Mm -hmm. How does that translate to civilian life? How do I how do I how do I word that on a resume doc? You know, and and they're right. They're really good at it, but they feel like they're not good at anything else, and that's where. The problem really is. I'm not good for anything else except killing people. Mm -hmm. That would be your meathead. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So now the next thing with Murphy and the the ear. Mm -hmm. Okay, so he's doing the. Yeah. We're human fucking beings, fellas. I mean, we're gonna have to be animals sometimes, but you can't go too far to the other side. Mm -hmm. You'll never come back. We will never come back. Yeah. So that was very directly inspired by the Pacific. Mm -hmm. And that's legit. That's legit. And and that was my belief too. So oh my. So I'll give you a specific mm -hmm. example. When I was in Afghanistan, this is a hilarious story. One of my machine gunners. Well, first he went to one of my squad leaders. Well, I wasn't really a. He wasn't my squad leader anymore. But. He was a section leader when I was the weapons platoon commander. Mm -hmm. And um, his name was Ryan, Sergeant Loya. An unbelievable Marine. I mean, this guy, this guy was meant to go to war. I would love to go to war with him again just because it was so much fun. And uh, he says, hey, sir, um, I want to use his name. We'll say, say uh, O'Donnell wants to talk to you. Mm -hmm. O'Donnell was this giant fucking guy. Um, I mean, probably like 6'5", a corn-fed country boy who uh, played college football for a minute before he joined the Marine Corps. Machine gunner, and he says, hey, he really wants to tell you something. So, you know, going back to all of this, this threat and this fear of, of killing civilians and whatnot, he says, um, hey, O'Donnell, tell him, tell him. So I'm like, what's up? And he goes, well, sir, uh, so, like, I saw this kid, uh, and he was shooting at us. And uh, he was shooting at us, and um, you know, then he put his weapon down, and then I kept scanning my sector, and then I saw the kid pop up again, but the kid didn't have a weapon on him anymore. And I think he said the kid was looked to be between 10 and 15, maybe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Of enemy age. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I used to joke around that guys in Helmand Province, they hit 15, and they don't mature anymore after that. 15, and then <laughs> next thing you know, you're an old man. <laughs> Such a old, man thing. Of, old man of 30? Yeah, such uh -huh. a shitty thing to say, but mm -hmm. I love those jokes. And um, so anyways, so the kid popped up, and uh, and I was like, okay. Oh, no, and he said, and when he came up again, you know, I didn't I didn't smoke him because, like, he didn't have a weapon on him, and and he, he kept going. I was like, hey, hey, look, man, if, if you don't want to smoke a kid, like, don't do it. 
-hmm. Like, I, I don't live, like, we'll find someone else to fucking, to, to shoot him. And he goes, oh, fuck that, so I'll smoke all these fucking kids. I don't give a fuck. I just didn't want to get njp <laughs> Yeah, two very separate issues. Two very separate issues. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, uh, Absolutely. And um, in that moment, because we had dealt with this with other kids, it was or with other guys, it was like, you know, there are some people, they're not built to fucking handle some of this stuff. No. And I think others are. Mm -hmm. And some will wear it better than others. Mm -hmm. And part of that depends on who we are as a person and our... our um, naturally born personality, mm -hmm. so to speak. And then it also depends on what we've experienced in life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So you want to talk about the ears and, and... Oh yeah, so the ear. So the ear thing, I just thought, it, th this is just going straight parody. I just knew it'd mm -hmm. be funny to all the, the sick grunts who, who like ear necklaces. And I used to have Warhammer 40,000 pieces. You know what those are? Is that the one with the itty bitty pieces? Yes. Okay. Tiny little pieces you put on the board game and you can design the pieces mm -hmm. you can you know, you can glue little pieces of armor on the guys and give them a sword and stuff. It's all futuristic warfighters. And, um, and then you paint them mm -hmm. the colors of whatever uh, army they are a part of, whatever unit. And it requires this intense attention to detail. Doing one of these things here, right? And so I used to do that as a kid. And I heard about a platoon sergeant who, he was a platoon sergeant of one of the platoon sergeants in our company, but back in Iraq, okay. I think in the invasion. And this guy was the nerdiest guy anyone in the platoon had ever met. He was just a geek, he had glasses, pretty you know, slender looking frame, and he had Warhammer 40,000. Um, I don't remember if he had it with Geo Bachelor in the, in the barracks or just at home, but he, like everyone knew mm -hmm. that he did Warhammer 40,000, he would paint the pieces. And he said, in a firefight, there was no one that you would rather have in a firefight. He said in the middle of a firefight, he'd like <laughs> pop up and be like, okay, 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 do this, do this, do this, do this. Blah, 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 got him, there's one. Da, 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 got him, there's two. And just very cool, calm, collected. Everything about war was like a video mm -hmm. game to him. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, oh my God, that's the coolest thing ever. He probably had such great attention to detail that he could hone in on a target quicker than other people. Probably. Yeah. Because I remember this guy specifically said mm -hmm. that this character that modeling the scene after, that he got a lot of kills. Did he? And, and everyone knew, like no one had smoked more dudes with their fucking M their rifle than mm -hmm. this guy had. Than this guy. This is a great shot. Yeah. And he just loved it. He just loved fucking war fighting. And you would never guess it because he's such a nerdy guy. Mm -hmm. And that's what I love about the Marine Corps, just infantry guys in general. You get the whole gamut mm -hmm. of fuck country fucks who can't, they can barely speak English, borderline illiterate, and then guys who <laughs> are looking forward to med school after the war. Yes. You know? Yes. It's incredible. Mm -hmm. And then, oh, and then former pro athletes, the whole, it's, it's so fun. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so that's what inspired the, the thing. Okay. I thought, I bet all these grunts. Everyone who loves the idea of an ear necklace would get a real kick out of cleaning it and mm -hmm. just putting I did. intention I did. and detail yeah. to it. I thought that was really funny. In fact, up until this point, and I know I married a combat veteran and, and I get that it's really my world all the time at work and at home, mm. but up until this point, I would have dated Murphy. I would not have been scared off. But when we start jacking off with arms and hands is where I have to draw the line. Okay, <laughs> so now he's on his own completely. Yeah. Absolutely. I, nothing, nothing to do with that anymore. I he still, lost me. I still wonder to this day if, <laughs> if I should have included that in the final cut. <laughs> well, I mean, it it got reactions. It did for sure. And that was part of the the thought process. And when we recut this into the movie mm -hmm. after you know the world had seen this, uh, I actually threw it out to the Facebook group, and I was like, should we include the you know the jack off scene in the last thing? They were like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that was my I favorite mean, part. This is just pure dark humor. Yeah. It really is. And and I had a couple family members watch this episode before you and I had discussed and, and we came up with the analysis idea. And one of them called me and said, did you not find that bothersome? And I said, no. And she said, I'm a little bit concerned about you. <laughs> and I said, I said, but I do this all day long. And she said, you need to be taking care of yourself. I mean, she was legitimately bothered by the fact that I was not bothered by it. So that kind of tells you yeah, I where can other relate. people are. I can relate. You can relate to I've, that. I've had a couple people yeah. you know, think something was seriously wrong with me. And mm -hmm. I'm like, really? You think so? Oh, you think that was a little funny? Come on. <laughs> I would have said, I, I said, are you qualified to make that decision? <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> yeah. Uh, but anyway, up until this point, I was good with Mur Murphy, and, and, and I'm out. Sorry. Yeah. I'm well, out. Murphy's not for everyone. Yeah. No. <laughs> no, definitely not anymore. Um, but yes. So let, let's talk a little bit about takeaways. Um, we honed in on the fact that anger and rage are simply a manufactured or secondary emotion to pain. Okay. I get it. People do not want to live in pain. They don't want to go back there, which part of the reason is part of the reason they don't ever want to go to therapy because why do I want to dredge up old shit that I've worked really hard to put away? Mm -hmm. Well, you can say that you've put it away, but if you're not enjoying life, if you're not generally happy or content with where you are, if you're battling depression, if you have outright nightmares or flashbacks or intrusive thoughts about these events, you need to go see somebody, mm. okay? If you're not willing to go see somebody, then you're kind of stuck in your own distorted world, and that's really hard to work your way out of. Mm. So that leaves us with things that you can control, and, and those things may be when the intrusive thought shows up, that you give it the attention that it has earned and deserves. In other words, it, I'm mowing the lawn, and this pops in my head, this bothersome item pops in my head. I think about it for two or three minutes. I acknowledge how angry I am about it. I acknowledge how painful it is. And then I move on with my day. Mm -hmm. Okay? Because until it, it's kind of like PTSD symptoms, PTS symptoms are kind of like door to door salesmen who continue to come back. If they ring the doorbell and you run to the other room and ignore them, what happens? They'll come back in They'll three come days. They'll come back. They'll come back in three days. Yes. If you answer the door and say, I don't own my home, I rent. I don't need siding, I don't need windows, I don't need steak off the back of a truck. <laughs> I don't need any of that. If you give them the attention they deserve, they may not come back as frequently, okay? Hmm. Because avoidance has basically become the ultimate coping, school for, uh, coping skill for many of you. Yes. Okay, avoidance is a coping skill. Um, it's not a healthy one, mm. okay? It works. I'm not saying it doesn't work, but it will only work for a certain period of time. This mm -hmm. is still with you. This has not been resolved. This has not gone anywhere, and it will not go anywhere unless you can process what happened. Yeah. Yeah. So. And he has chosen to embrace that which, and, and then this, this, was, this was my philosophy, mm -hmm. was I'm going to embrace that which is going to scare me. It is so much easier and so much more acceptable to be angry in the military than it is to be hurt. Oh yeah, the it's whole culture. Very, yes, we, yes. I mean, we could we could we yeah. could talk for a very long time about this. Yeah. But the whole the whole Marine Corps culture, mm -hmm. the whole military culture, but Marine Corps especially, it's a culture of hate and destruction. Mm -hmm. Your job. Well, is yeah, to destroy. that's what I thought my taxpayer dollars were going for. Yeah. I mean. <laughs> Right. What's what's right? Ne what's what's needed to be a good marine and win wars is mm -hmm. hate and destruction. Hate and destruction. Right? What's good to to, uh, to lead a happy life is love and creation. Mm -hmm. The complete opposite of what exists in here. Yeah, absolutely. For myself, you know, I I never wanted to see things that grossed me out or creeped me out. So I would force myself to be desensitized to those things and forced myself to try and love those things. Remember when a bunch of guys em embrace the horror, embrace, embrace, embrace the, horror. the suck. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but the, mm -hmm. the, the horror specifically, because yeah. a lot of times I noticed, I remember the first time I saw a bunch of Afghan dead bodies mm -hmm. mangled the shit. They were A&A &A guys. Mm -hmm. They popped an ID in the back of a truck or something. Uh, they were mangled horribly. Mm -hmm. And the what I felt seeing them was just like, oh, my stomach was like, oh. Mm -hmm. And my whole body was my my heart's pumping faster. I could I could feel I could feel my heart rate going. These guys are steaming from they were just on fire mm -hmm. and they're mangled. burned skin. Oh, the, burned the skin. Smell the smell and the smell. crunch of burned skin. The smell yeah. was I mean it was it was fucking body odor. It was is by their body mm -hmm. odor on fire <laughs> with with and, and uh, meat. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember all this feeling of just like oh god I was mm -hmm. my initial feeling was so uncomfortable and I'm just like I cannot walk away from this so I just walked the line of them and I just looked at them and I'm like okay cool 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 all right yeah well this is try not war try not to throw up cool 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 yeah and that's the thing I don't I don't want my body language my my anything to exude that I detest this keep it together I'm like I was like okay this is war, so I signed up for. 
sick. Yeah. Thank God they're not Marines. Yes. And then we call the medevac. Yes. So one, one side note to that, people forget about how violent humanitarian aid missions can be. Mm. And I have had people in, in, who come back and they have said um, Haiti was, was far worse than Iraq. Mm. Iraq was controlled. We were the dominant force. We were doing well. Haiti, there were dead bodies everywhere next to burning tires, and you would open up a barrel and there would be a gagged person with a bullet hole in their head. Mm. And so you have to think that it's not just the combat veteran who sees death in that manner. It's all of the veterans who are going to all of the other countries in the world who operate like that. It really is. It's mm. everywhere. And so you may not be an Iraq veteran, but that doesn't mean that you haven't had a traumatic experience in that realm. Hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, was that uh, was that the conclusion to episode two? Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah. Disassociation to the pain and the savagery. That'll fucking that'll do you good in war. But not now. All right. Maestro. Thanks for the talk about episode two. We'll see you guys on episode three.